Our scripture lesson this morning is from Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, and so if you have your Bibles, you can turn to that passage or follow along on the screen. Ephesians chapter 5, reading verse, beginning in verse 22 and reading through 27. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy and cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. And to present her to himself as a radiant church. I think some translations even paraphrase and say a radiant bride. Without spot or wrinkle. Without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish. But holy and blameless. Will you pray with me? Lord, once again, we bow before your word and ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would uh, do that work in us, that, Lord, you would strengthen, build up, reprove, help us, O God, that we might be more like you in every way in this day. Bless, O God, we pray this time that we ask your spirit to search our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning I'm beginning a new series. Actually, uh, it's going to go through the month of February and March and take us right up to Holy Week uh, before uh, Easter. Uh, And the title of the message, title of the series is, What Makes a Great Church? That's a good question. What makes a great church? And some of you may have been listening to Ephesians 5, and and I understand uh, a lot of times uh, when you hear Ephesians 5, 22, uh, about wives submit to husbands, and 25, where husbands, you uh, love your wives, and stuff, that, that we think this passage is about marriage. And it is, but it's really about the church. Really, that, that, you know, Paul was, Paul was using the church to talk about marriage and he was using the marriage relationship to talk about the church. And so, forgive me this morning or, or not forgive me, whichever way you want to do it, but I'm going to talk about the church. This is not really a talk about the marriage, although there's a lot to be gleaned from this. But I believe that's what Paul was really trying to hold up. He was wanting us to see the church. He was wanting us to see what makes a church great. What makes a great church. See, I I think that's what God is wanting to do in us and here at this church uh, and, and in our lives together. I think God has been preparing us. I know that we just came through a season where we were looking at a possible merger with with real church and it went a long time, a year and a half. And and I won't pretend to be able to tell you why all things happen the way they do. But I can tell you this much, I don't think that God ever wastes a thing. God is incredibly efficient. In all that he does. He's economical. He doesn't let a penny fall to the ground. He's always up to something. And I believe that even in this moment. And even in the adversities of life. Even in the struggles and trials and storms of life. I believe that God has been preparing us. God is wanting to do something in our life. My dad used to always say that, he'd say, you know, he says if the devil has a tongue and the devil has knees, even the devil will bow the knee and confess that Jesus is Lord. Even the works of the enemy are going to glorify God somehow, some way, if God's people will get on their knees and realize what God is up to and take the authority that we've been given. 
Because it's not God's will that anyone should perish and that none should, none should be lost. And so that's God's purpose. He's been preparing. He's been working in our lives. He's during, during this, you know, and again, can't say exactly it, what all God was doing, although I know God was doing an awful lot. I believe God, and, and this is what he does in all of our testings and all of the trials that we face, all the adversity. God is testing our hearts. God is testing our hearts. And sometimes I'm not so sure I pass those tests. Sometimes I'm not so sure we have passed those tests. But I believe that those tests are there. I believe that's what God's doing. He's testing our... And, and, and just to a word of encouragement, the, the, the stronger, the more difficult the test, the greater the blessing that's coming. Hallelujah. The, the stronger the test, the greater will be the reward. Yes, sir. If we pass the test. But God wants to get us on our knees. That's why we did the month of January, a time of fasting and prayer. And, uh, and actually, it was a time of repentance. And, 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 and by the way, repentance does not mean I'm sorry. There's a, there's a lot of sorry people in the world today. There's a lot of sorry people in church. But that doesn't mean repentance. Repentance means to change the mind. It doesn't mean to be sorry. Repentance means to change the mind and change your direction. And so... I believe that's what God's wanting to do. He's wanting us to line up with him. He's wanting us to humble ourselves and, and position ourselves so that God can do what God wants to do in us and in me and in you. Well, many of you know that I'm a, I'm a, I do mission work in Cuba. And uh, I've been doing it since 94, and I love going to Cuba. And, and right now I've got a son in Cuba. Beth and I have a son in Cuba who is uh, uh, not, we've told him he can't come home until he's got the wedding date nailed down, okay? He's uh, seeing a, a, a beautiful Cuban girl, and uh, so we may have more than one reason to go to Cuba than just missions. But there's a revival going in in Cuba. Since, 19, since 1981, there's been a tremendous revival going on in Cuba. Uh, and and, and it's, it's an amazing thing. Uh, one of the, recently, I took a pastor in with me to Cuba who had never been there before. And one of the first things that he said when, he, when we went to one of our meetings, he said, My goodness, those people are so hungry. I've never seen hunger like this before. I've never seen teachableness. I've never seen humility like these people have. And I said, that's why there's revival. That's why the church is alive. That's why there's revival fires. That's why, and, and I, I don't have a problem saying this. Cuba has, is, the church in Cuba is a great church. It's a great church. Now, it's got lots of flaws. It's got lots of challenges. Uh, but, but it is a great church. It is a, it is a church that's hard after God, humbling itself, seeking God day and night. I tell the story, and for, forgive me, I tell stories a lot over and over again, but one of the, on one occasion I was invited to preach at the bishop's church, Bishop uh, Ricardo Perea, Methodist bishop. And we had dinner with them in the evening, and, and uh, he, it was a Thursday night, and the bishop said to me, he said, uh, Pastor Tim, he said, uh, Thursday night service, I said, I don't know what kind of a crowd we'll have, and I said, that's fine, bishop, it's, it's, it's a large church in Cuba, they'll have seven, eight hundred people there, it's uh, uh, in, on a Sunday morning, easily, uh, and he said, I don't know what to expect, and I said, that's fine, it doesn't matter, I'm just thrilled for the privilege and opportunity to preach. We, we ate dinner, we came in through the chancel area, and he said, go ahead and have a seat in the front row, and me and the team sat down, and, and I was trying to collect my thoughts, and I, and I looked out over the congregation, uh, and there was like seven or eight people there, uh, and this big auditorium, bigger than this one, seven or eight people, and they were sitting, and, uh, and I thought, well, this could be it, you know, this could be the size of the crowd, but as I sat down, I heard this humming sound, I heard this strong humming sound, and I thought, what is that noise, and I'd look over my shoulder, and 
seven or eight people sitting out there and this humming sound. And, uh, and I thought, well, okay. And uh, as we sat there, it was before the service started, just a couple minutes before the service started, uh, I heard another little bit of a noise and I glanced over my shoulder and the place was packed. And I looked at the bishop and I said, where did all those people come from? He said, they've been here the whole time. They were on their knees and you couldn't see them. You were looking at the ones who couldn't get on their knees and they were sitting down. The rest of them were all on their knees praying for about 20 to 30 minutes before the service started. Do you under, are you catching a glimpse as to why there's revival, why there's hunger? Now listen, in Cuba, 1959, when the revolution took place, the church lost m many of their buildings and properties. The government confiscated them, took them down, took them, dismantled them, gave them away, uh, used them for other purposes, but took them away from the church. The church had no recourse to get their property back. In fact, it's not, it, the, the Cuban church understands that Everything that they got, everything that they have could disappear tomorrow. They know that. So they don't depend on their building. They don't depend on, actually they don't even depend on their pastor. Because the pastors all know that they could get a knock on the door at night and disappear and not see their family again with no recourse. Over the years, I've made good friends with some of those pastors in 1959 at the time of the revolution that were rounded up and taken to some of those concentration camps uh, out, in the, out in the Cuban countryside. And there's a great deal of suffering there. So they know that. But you know what? That doesn't stop them. It doesn't stop them. They're not stopped by not having buildings that take account. In fact, it's incredible. You'll find, as I've said before, you'll find 70 to 80 people in the pastor's living room. You'll find 100 people in the backyard out under a tree in the middle of an August, Cuban August, sun, sunshiny morning. And on and on. The people are hungry. They want God. They don't care. I, one of the times I went into, a, uh, I was invited to speak at a home group and went into this little uh, apartment area and uh, 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 and as I walked in, there was like, it was just, it was just a two-room apartment, basically. And that one room where we were going to meet was just shoulder to shoulder. And they said, you're going to preach and, uh, and share tonight. And I said, okay, good. And they said, oh, wait a minute. Before, before you do, we're going to worship. And I said, okay, great. I like to do that. And they slid open the patio doors and they sang at the top of their lungs to the whole apartment complex because they didn't care who was listening. They're fearless. I suppose when you got nothing to lose, you're willing to gain everything. But sometimes, you know, we hold on so tightly to our little turf and our little areas and our little, we, we hold on to our comfort. We hold on to what we are familiar with and we can't understand why God doesn't move. Can't understand. Where's God? Can't understand what God is doing. In 1981, though, when the church was in Cuba was just about ready to flicker out, because in 1959 was the revolution, and, they, and the government was coming at, at the church hard and uh, taking the pastors away, uh, and uh, uh, many of the churches had dwindled down to just uh, two or three or five older people in the congregation, uh, no young people. No young people at all in those churches. 1981, God sovereignly moved on that island and revival broke out on both ends of the island and moved to the middle. And if you go to Cuba today, you'll find that 70 to 80% of the churches are young people. Wow. Young people, under the age of 30. How did that happen? All those young people that are in the church today were born after the revolution. They were completely schooled in atheistic communism. How in the world are they in the church today? Well, it's because the gospel fills the emptiness in people's hearts. Those churches in Cuba, they changed their music. 
they became, they got into the salsa worship and, and the young people started flocking to the church and, and today the church is incredibly alive and on fire and they can't stop it. The government can't stop it. Uh, it's, it's more than just the economy. It has to do with the gospel. It has to do with the gospel changing and, tra and tra revolutionizing. The Holy Spirit is blowing through the church there. And listen, one more thing about the church in Cuba that's different, so much different from the church in America, and that is that they believe in evangelism that reaches the lost. Yes, yes, Instead of shuffling Christians from one church to another. Do you, un do you understand very oftentimes, churches that are big churches, growing churches, they're growing from transfer, not from reaching the lost. They don't have transfers in Cuba. They don't have shuffling. They don't even have church hopping in Cuba. They are reaching the lost and not only reaching them, but then discipling them. Well, we live in a new day. We live in a, this is a new decade, 2020. Uh, and we have numerous challenges. The challenges that we're facing today, mindset and attitudes, uh, increasingly non church anti-Christian culture that we live in. Technology and online church and everything else coming at us and changes that we're not prepared for. Society competing for our time, our money, our commitment. I can remember one time I was, I was uh, belly aching to the Lord. Oh Lord, how do we get these people more committed to God? This is this is not this church, by the way. This was a church down the road. I'm just telling you that. It was another church. And I said, Lord, how do I get them more committed? And the Lord responded right away. It kind of surprised me. He says, oh, they're committed. They're committed to things that aren't giving them life. They're, they're, in fact, he said, Tim, they're overcommitted. So it's not a matter of, they're, they're just not committed to the right things. We're living in a time in which culture is changing and things are happening rapidly. And listen, we can't run from the world. Uh, uh, we can't run from things that we don't like. And, and, and you know, we don't, we don't like this. We don't like that. And the preacher didn't shake my hand. And we, they don't like the music. And we, we can't run away from those kinds of things. Instead, maybe, maybe, maybe God is trying to get our attention in order to get us on our knees so that God can do what God wants to do. That's why we had the fasting last month, was as a way of softening our heart and positioning ourselves so that we can hear from God. That's what repentance is all about. It's about changing the mind and aligning with God. Because listen, we, we, have the, we have the same unlimited, unstoppable Holy Spirit dwelling within us. We have the same word of God and, and the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have the same mission and purpose and calling. And we have the same need to reach the lost as ever. Those first Christians, first century Christians, such as who Paul was talking to in the church of Ephesus, they had to figure out how to reach into and pierce their pagan, unbelieving, dark, sinful culture with the good news. The same as us. They had to figure it out. So, some of us, some of us are, uh, are trying to figure out how to, how to reach our families how to reach our children and our grandchildren. Why? Because we don't want them to be lost. We want them to be saved. We know that the return of the Lord is very soon. We need to pray and fast and seek the Lord. Because now's the time to get ready. I was telling somebody that the other day. You know, sometimes we get the idea that, you know, with the prophecies, we'll see the Lord coming. And then we'll get ready. No, 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 no. We'll see the Lord coming, but by that time, it'll be too late to get ready. Now is the time. Today is the day. 
Well, what makes a great church? That's the question. What makes a great church? You see, I, I think God in this passage of scripture, even though he's talking about marriage, that was pretty clever of him to do that. He's also talking about the church and he's holding up a mirror. He's holding up a vision. You know, you see, what you see, the vision is what changes you. Yeah. It's, it's what transforms your life, yeah. what you see. And God was holding up that mirror of what he sees yeah, and his principles. Verse 22 is the passage, this verse where he says, wives submit to your husbands. Submission. That's a, that's a principle for the church. Did you know that? Not just for marriage, but for the church. Submission. And by the way, submission is not through gritted teeth. <laughs> so I said, oh, I'm going to obey the Lord if it kills me, you know. No. That's not submission. It's not submission at all. Submission to Christ as the head of the church in everything. And it does require repentance. And then verse 25, sacrificial. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. How did he love the church? Sacrificially. To the point of laying down his life. It's that agape love. That's the kind of love it is. It's not, it's not love based on a feeling. It's not, it's not a love based upon circumstances at all. Agape love has nothing to do with circumstances. It is a decision that we make. It's a choice of the will. It's obedience to what God has commanded. We're going to love each other no matter what. Sacrificial agape love. He talks about that in verse 26 and 27 that... That we might present, that we might present uh, uh, to make her holy, cleansing her by washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, a radiant bride, without stain or wrinkle or blemish. Yes. Yes. Like a bride. Like a bride. Yes. The Holy Spirit. That's what he's doing, folks. In Revelation chapter, what is it? Revelation 19 verse 7. It talks about how that, uh, it says that the bride made herself ready. Well, you know, that's what happens. Brides get ready. They make themselves ready for the groom who is coming. They don't, they don't let down their guard, you know, with curlers in their hair and, and the dress not ready and on and on. No, no, no. They're ready because they don't know the day or the hour. They don't know when he's going. They don't know when the shout. They don't know when the trumpet's going to come. So they make themselves ready. Folks, right now, I'm telling you, now's the time to make yourself ready. You're not going to get the chance. You, there won't be the chance once Certain things are triggered. Yeah. It's now. Yeah. Now's the time to make ourselves ready. And I believe that's what the Holy Spirit is trying to do. I believe that's what the Lord was trying to do with this, with this uh, situation in, reg in regards to the merger with real church. I believe that the Lord was trying to get this church ready, trying to expose and reveal what was in the heart, things that maybe we were not willing to look at, things that we didn't want to see in the mirror, but there they were. There they were. Make her, the bride ready. Holy, set apart. That's what holy means. Holy means to be set apart for God. She's to be set apart for God, or for the groom and the groom only. Forsaking all others, only unto him, only unto her, so long as you both shall live. That's holiness. That's holiness. Blameless, without shame or moral disgrace, without fault. What? What makes a great church? I, I want to list seven things. And these are actually going to be some of the topics that we're going to deal with in this sermon series over the, over the next seven or eight weeks, however long that we have here. Uh, but these are some of the things that I believe uh, are principles for the bride making herself ready. 
The first one, the first one is that a great church is a, is a people of, of diversity. Different denominations, different races, ethnics, different styles and cultures and preferences, different generations. How many of you know that the gospel of Jesus Christ is bigger than any of the boxes that we try to put him in? Yes, sir. We do. We try to put God, well, God, you know, I think you, you are a God of the traditional worship. Yes, or you're the God of the... Bethel contemporary worship, or you're the God of, of the black gospel worship. No, no, God's bigger than that. Did you know that? He's bigger than all of the, He's bigger than, than all the different categories. And the church that is a great church does away with walls and barriers. <laughs> Revelation chapter 19, and then also again in 21, says that there was with there were every tribe, tongue, and nation around the throne. Every tribe, tongue, and nation. There were no walls. There were no barriers. A great church is a church where there are no barriers. Maybe, maybe I'm envious a little bit of the Cuban church because they, don't, they can't bank on having a, a building or walls because it, it, it can be taken away from them in a heartbeat. And so the church is no longer a building. The church is the people. It's the people of God. Without walls and barriers actually without limits see that's what it is it's without when the moment we put up barriers the moment we we have categories the moment we have styles and preferences on we have limits a great church is a church listen a great church is a church is a is a community of friends of Jesus now I said that carefully because the church, a great church is not a community of friends. Those last two words are key. You see, a community of friends can be a clique. A community of friends can be a club. A community of friends can be a country club. But a community of friends of Jesus, oh my goodness, that's a different, that's different. You see, sometimes we get all caught up in, well, our friends and our emotions and we've had experience and memories and we tie in and, and listen, no, 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 no. The church is a community of the friends of Jesus. Jesus is the head of the church. That's where our unity comes from. G we are friends of Jesus. And anybody that's a friend of Jesus is a friend of mine and yours. A great church is a community of friends of Jesus. That's where our spiritual unity comes from, to love one another, as it says in John 13, 34. The word koinonia, that means common, being in common. Uh, it is that word for fellowship used to describe this friendship with Jesus that existed in the community of the believers. Thirdly, a great church is a mission-minded church, uh, a church that witnesses, a church that is outward focused, a church that is inward focused. That's not, that's not the gospel. The gospel is about outward focus. It's about, it's about being salt and light. It's about making an impact and changing in the community, being a witness. Yes. You, some of you have heard me say before that Beth and I were sent here about coming up on nine years now. And uh, this was the first time that we came to pastor a church where we didn't have children, okay? And some of you are saying, and your point is, hallelujah, you know? <laughs> no, 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 no. You got to understand that in all the other churches we pastored, the day we moved in, we had immediate connections to the community, through the soccer program, through the school program, through uh, neighborhood, through all kinds of connections. Now... We don't have those same connections now because our kids have all grown up and moved away and they're scattered and so on. So in order for us to have a witness, we've got to be real, we got to work real hard at it. We've got to be very intentional about it because we don't have the natural connections of the soccer program or the football program or the school or the, or the uh, various things going on in the community. But a great church is a mission-minded, outward-focused witness in a community. 
Fourthly, a great church is a church that trains and equips and empowers for the purpose of making disciples. You see, sometimes we we focus more about, you know, getting people saved, but it's not just getting people saved, it's getting people saved and then discipled so that the people that are discipled can go out and save more. See, that's the way it's supposed to work. Somebody gets saved. And then they get discipled and then they go out and are involved in getting somebody else saved and introduced. And then they get discipled and then they go out and those people that just got saved will now be discipled so that they can go out and get other people saved. And then they get discipled. Do you understand it's supposed to be reproducing? And a church that is not reproducing is a church that's either unhealthy or sick or dying. I'm not, I'm not a sheep herder, but I've learned that a long time ago. Unhealthy sheep do not reproduce. They don't. Healthy sheep, like healthy rabbits, <laughs> can't help it. Can't help it. Because reproduction is not just a natural thing. It is a spiritual thing principle. A great church is a church that trains and equips and empowers and makes disciples in order to bring people into maturity. Into maturity. Sometimes the churches that don't, don't focus on discipleship and training and equipping, they don't have mature believers. Maturity in their faith. And God wants us all to become mature in our faith. That's why sometimes he takes us through the wilderness. That's why sometimes we have to go through adversity and trial because God's trying to get to something, trying to build up, trying to zero in on. You know, we've said it before, the children of Israel came out of Egyptian slavery, but then they had to wander around in the wilderness for 40 years in order to get the slavery out of them. They were out of slavery, but then he had to get the slavery out of them in order to be able to take the promised land. Number five, a great church is a gathering of worshipers. Gathering of worshipers. And again, that's beyond styles and and preferences. The worship is about the presence. That's why we keep saying that. It's about being presence-driven. A presence-driven church church. Doesn't matter what the style or what the preference, what doesn't matter what the bulletin says. What matters is, is God there? Did God show up? Number six, a great church is where God's word is preached and taught and lived. You know, it's, it's, it's more than just preaching and teaching, but it's also about modeling and living it out, walking the talk. And Paul talks an awful lot about that, even in the book of Ephesians, that we need to not only preach the word and teach the word, but to live the word in our relationships and, and in all that we do. And then finally, a great church is a church that helps people get rid of the personal garbage and the spots and the wrinkles and the pollution that so easily so easily clutters our lives and a a great church is a church that helps people overcome overcome and be sanctified set apart it's a church that helps people be holy it's a church that helps people be set apart from the world if the church looks like the world then something is not right there we need to be about becoming holy and defeating sin defeating sin now having said all that there is no perfect church okay and there is no perfect pastor. Amen? You didn't say that very loud, okay? Uh, There is no perfect pastor, okay? Uh, Okay, that's a little bit better. There is no perfect congregation either. It's all by God's grace. It's by God's grace. Grace is God doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves. It's all by God's grace. That's why none of us can boast 
None of us can think we're all that in a bag of chips. No, none of us can sit back in our laurels. No, none of us can, can do that. It's only by God's grace. Only by God's grace. So if we have a great church, and we have, it's because we have a great Savior. And if we have a great Savior, let's not keep it a secret. Let's not keep it a secret. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for your presence here with us. Thank you for your word to us. Thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit who's doing a work in each of our hearts, Lord, as we depend and look to your grace. Where sin abounds, grace does that much more abound. Let the grace of God abound among us, O oh God. That we might be a great church. That we might humble ourselves and repent. That we might seek your face and turn from our wicked ways. So that you might heal us, heal our land, forgive our sins. Help us, O oh God, to position ourselves before you. Make, may the bride get ready. May the bride get ready. Grant it, Father, I pray in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Will you stand with me for our benediction? And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.